Woohoo! We are back with 5.3 equations and applications with exponential and logarithmic functions, which is a lot. But basically, we're going to be working with exponential functions and possibly using logarithms to help us with that. And I've invited Godzilla to help us with this one. Godzilla also has degrees in math and economics. And um, surprisingly, I know a lot of people don't know that about her. But um, she's she's really good with this and really loves supply and demand, a subject that I really love, too. I find it really, really interesting. So we're actually going to do our exploration using number six from the book, which says, suppose the demand function for Q thousand units of a certain commodity is given by this equation, and it is P equals 30 times the quantity 3 raised to the power of the opposite of q over 2, which already, I know some people are already thinking, maybe I should go hide under the bed. And the answer is, this is a complicated equation, but we're totally going to get through this. We're going to use some logarithms to help us out. We're going to use a little graphing. This will all make sense. And so part of it, I did want to remind you, when we're talking about a demand equation, demand equation is any time we're looking at the relationship, and Godzilla is agreeing, yes, um, relationship between price and quantity, or price and quantity, depending on your perspective. And the idea behind this is that from a consumer's perspective, so that's the demand equation, it's the consumer's perspective, not the supplier's not not the person who owns the store or is setting, selling the commodities. This is from the person who's buying it. So as the price starts to fall, usually in a normal good, um, as the price falls, the demand goes up. And as the price goes up, the demand falls. So again, the idea is for normal goods, not luxury goods, um, if if it's more expensive, you're going to buy less of it. If it's less expensive, you're going to buy more of it. And what we're talking about here is we're not told the commodity, but we know this equation. Equation. And in the last part, what I'm going to do is we're going to look at, and you can kind of see through, there's a ghost of a graph. Ooh, spooky graph ghosts. That would be the scariest thing, wouldn't it? If graph ghosts started taking over your house, that would be haunting. Um, but we will talk about um, the graph, which I've printed out, so we can talk about the graph and look at what's happening. So, and I've got my Godzilla friend here to support me, because again, word problems can be stressful. Remember to breathe. Whew. And if and if you feel yourself spinning or blanking, just take a break. Um, I've got a lovely, uh, I've personally got a bunch of water over here. You know, bring snacks, bring stuffed animals, bring support creatures or monsters as you'd like. And let's go ahead and approach this problem. So first question, at what price will the demand equal 4,000 units? And already I can, again, I see people jumping under the bed. It's, and, and we can totally do this. So when it says at what price, this part, this I'm going to go ahead and just use pink. At what price means P is what we don't know. Okay, so at what price is, is the English way to, to uh, say that? P equals what? And then we're also told demand. Now, in this case, demand is represented by Q. So Q equals, and now here's where things get a little bit, a little bit tricksy. And the thing is, I can't promise you the real world isn't like this. The real world is totally like this. And what I'm going to say, and you all might be guessing it before I do, I'm going to say Q in this case is 4. And you're all going to go, what? Ah, nothing makes sense. And I'm going to say, I know, I know. And that's why I chose this problem, because I wanted to go over it. So in a safe, gentle environment, we, rather than just throwing this at you in the homework, we can say, okay, let's talk about this. Because right here it says Q is measured in thousands of units. So if it's 4,000 units, Q is 4. How many thousands? 4,000. 
Okay, so we can already be a little cranky with this with this setup, but this is this is actually the way things work in the quote unquote real world. So let's keep going. Okay, I've got Q equals four. I don't know what P is, and I know that I have a formula: thirty times three to the negative four over two. Negative Q over two, negative four over two. So this is actually something that I could, because four over two reduces, I can calculate this on my own. So I could just do this without a calculator. Remember three to the negative two, or three to the negative second power, is one over three squared. So that's equal to 30 times one over nine, which is 30, over 9, I can reduce that by 3, 10 thirds, so that's approximately, uh, what is it? Oh, now I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trusting myself. It's 3.33, right? So 10 divided by 3, yeah, 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 3.33, I'm going to round, so approximately $3.33. So if we charge $3.33, we'll end up with selling 4,000 of the units. That is what, um, what someone has calculated. And it is fair, it is fair to ask, how in the heck do people know this? Like, where did this equation even come from? How do we know what the elasticity of demand is? Ooh, there's an economics term. That's fun. <coughs> How do we know how responsive price change, um, demand is to price change? And the answer is, well, a lot of things. Um, and in fact, for some of you, that's going to be um, a whole business degree, right? You're going to study that possibly even part of your MBA, part, possibly even further than that. Um, but where can you see it in your real world? Well, you can see it in your real world in little pieces when a company sends you a coupon or when you're listening to a podcast and someone says, hey, if you use the name of this podcast, you can save 50%. Um, and so that is one way to kind of test. It's a little muddy because you're not just testing demand. You're not just testing for, you know, what demand and, and price the relationship. You're also testing advertising. You're testing a bunch of stuff when that happens. But certainly a company can have a sale and then they can watch to see how many of the item everyone buys. So in other words, if milk suddenly goes on sale at the store and you're a family that drinks milk, you might buy more of them. And the store can actually track how many more milks are being bought. So that's one way that they can they can look at this. And obviously this takes more than just looking at how people are buying milk. It takes a lot of other you know, information and data. So, but it looks like I got $3.33. But I am also hearing a little bit from you. Pardon me, Godzilla. Thank you so much. Um, I'm also hearing from you that you're like, ah, but I don't want to do fractions. And the answer is, oh, okay, I understand that. In a perfect world, you do the fractions because it's great practice. It's like doing your setups. Um, I don't know anyone who likes them, but you do them so that your stomach stays strong, right? Your core stays strong. But if you're really like, no, today is leg day, it's not fraction day, then I would say, okay, 30. And again, you can either write this as a multiplication or as parentheses. I'll go ahead and do parentheses because I got them. I do three. Remember here for the exponent for this one, I use my x to the exponent key. Um, on this on this calculator, it would be that up arrow. On other calculators, I don't have I haven't bought one of each calculator in the universe, so I can't show you all of them. But in most calculators, it'll either be one of these exponent keys. Make sure you don't fall for the x squared one, or this up arrow one. Okay, so I'm gonna do that. And then I'm going to do negative 2. Now, again, remember when it's not a minus, it's a sign, so it's negative 2. You have to use this key, not the minus key. This is subtraction only. 
Um, it's interesting because as a human, as a human person, you have learned how to use minuses in both ways and you're very flexible. Calculators, not flexible at all, not actually human, believe it or not. I know people say calculator, you know, human calculator and all that, not true. The calculator sees subtraction as being incredibly different from the opposite of. So I'm gonna use the opposite of, so negative two, close my parentheses, enter, ta-da! Yay! Okay, first problem survived. Now, what if you didn't catch this? Well, if you didn't catch that this was four, you're gonna end up with a really weird number. And whenever you get a weird answer, I'll remind you that um, if you're working on homework, you get a weird answer, you can ask a tutor, you can ask me, you can say, hey, I got a really weird answer, can we talk about it? And I'm happy to do that, woohoo. Okay, first part down, yes! Second part. How many units to the nearest thousand units will be demanded if price is 17.32? So $17.32. So here we get price equals 17.32 and quantity is unknown. Okay, are you ready? Deep breath. Get your support crew right by you. Um, I'm going to tell you Godzilla is sure you can do this. Look at that big smile. Godzilla is absolutely sure you can do this. Whether you need to do some math or maybe just knock down a bunch of buildings in Midtown, either way, Godzilla's got your back, right? Probably don't knock down a bunch of buildings in Midtown. Um, Godzilla acknowledges that she was just really, really upset about, um, you know, really the metaphor of the way man has, has meant, you know, people in general have destroyed the environment. And then she is very sorry about that and is, you know, rethought that. So she was a moment of rage, um, you know, about, you know, the destruction of the environment. And I think we can all get behind that. We understand that. But again, not okay to knock down buildings. We all agree with that. Yes, but okay to do math problems. Excellent. That is a great way to, to solve the problems of the world. Do this math problem. Excellent. Okay. So I've got P equals 17.32. Q is I don't know. So let's go ahead and plug it in. So I've got 17.32 equals 30 times 3 raised to the negative Q over 2. Yay! So hopefully you're recognizing this as being just like a lot of the problems we had in um, section 5.2. So this Rather than a calculation, this is going to be some algebraic manipulation. Why is that? Well, because this the variable is up inside, kind of stuck in this little tower, very Tangled style. I, I probably should have the, the little chameleon from Tangled here that I could bring in as a support animal for us right now. Um, so we got to get this cue out of here. And in order to do that, we're going to have to do some algebra. So first thing, remember this... I've got, I don't know if you can hear, I've got a very angry hummingbird outside. They're, they're very angry. They're fighting. Um, it's really cute, though. Um, I'm going to divide both sides by 30. Oh, sorry. That got really big. I apologize. That's a little, it looks almost like subtraction. I will fix that in the next step. Let me give myself a little bit more room. So I've got 17.32 over 30 equals 3 raised to the negative Q over 2. Now, you will notice that I am not coming up with an approximation for this. And the answer is that I am going to leave this in one piece. I know it's ugly and, and uncomfortable, but remember that you don't want to round in the middle of a problem. So if something cancels exactly, so I could cancel, say, twos. I could cancel twos here, or I could, um, yeah, that's pretty much, that's it. So I should cancel by two if you if you want, but I'm just gonna leave it here because I see now that I have an exponential relationship here. So I'm gonna go ahead and use a logarithm. Remember, logarithms are how we get things down out of exponents. Your choice. You can use log base three if you'd like, especially if you have a really nice calculator like this that'll do other bases, awesome. But um, you know, most calculators, you've got two choices usually, log, or natural log, or 
you do have the change of base. So if you really want, you could use log base 17. If that's what, if that's what makes your heart happy, do it. Go for it. Um, I'm going to go ahead. I, I'm going to, I'm going to door the Explorer style, ask you which one you want to use log or natural log. And I hear log. Okay. So I apologize. If you said natural log, I'm sorry. More people said log. And I'm going to use common log to pull this down. Remember when I take a logarithm, the exponent comes down in front. Now, rather than, oops, you can't quite see it. There you go. Rather than trying to smash this into the space I've got left, which I'm really tempted. I want to just smash. I'm going to get myself a nice, oh, this is not a clear piece of paper. That's no good. I'm going to get a blank piece of paper. Ooh, this one's blank. And I'm going to continue there. The more complicated the math gets, the bigger you should start writing, just so that you're sure you're not missing anything. So at this point, what do we do? Oh no, oh, we cover up the ring light. That's what we do. Sorry. The ring light just, it's just, it just wants to be seen. Okay, so. I need this Q that's over here. I got a bunch of things in the way. I got a minus sign, I got a one half, and I logarithm. And it's up to you how you approach this. I'm going to multiply both sides by negative one. And I get the opposite of log 17.32 over 30 equals. Wow. I don't know what happened to that Q. I think part of the problem is I just don't like writing Qs. I'm sorry if your name starts with the Q. Okay, so first things first. I got rid of that minus. Now, many of you are saying, uh, can't you just toggle the minus to the other side? Yes, you can. However, I just want to show you what all the steps look like. Feel free to put me on two times speed or, you know, skip some steps. Do that dot 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 that you when you hit it twice and it'll go forward 10 seconds and I'll probably be still be talking. OK, I'm going to multiply by both sides by two. So I get negative two times the logarithm of 17.32 over 30 equals and then my twos cancel completely yay and I just get two q log three and then I divide both sides by logarithm logarithm of three remember that logarithm by itself is not a thing. You have to have a log with a number. Am I allowed to divide both sides by logarithm of three? Yes, because the log of three will not be zero. Right? We know that's non-zero. Oh my goodness, we got there. So this is a lot. This is what basically an essay looks like in math, right? And Godzilla's still here saying, you're, you're doing so great. And very impressed that at no point did you get really angry and say, knock down an entire city. Good on you. Excellent work. So now we have to figure out how to calculate this guy, which there's a lot going on. So what I'm going to do is... I'm going to use the way that I like to approach these is I'm going to calculate the numerator and get the answer and then divide by the denominator. So my number will I'll look like this. I'm going to use my opposite of two, not subtract two, but the opposite of two. And then I'm just going to put that up against log. Now for this particular calculator, remember that to get to logarithm, 
you have to hit the log key twice. So if I hit it once, it's natural log. If I hit it twice, it's common log. Regular calculators, non-fancy 36X Pros, will have their own logarithm key. So this is just, that what they've done is they've smashed everything together so they can get more keys in there. Okay, so I've got negative 2 times the logarithm, and notice it started a parenthesis. So then I can do 17.32 divided by 30, close parenthesis. See how I did that? Okay, if your logarithm does not open up a parenthesis, make sure you do that because you've got to keep these two numbers together there. And I'm going to go ahead and hit enter and I get that weird number. Now, remember, do not just write this number down. The calculator is telling me how much it feels like I can handle, but it knows way more than, than that. So don't just write down the number and then re-enter it. If you need to stop for some reason, go ahead and put this into your memory in the calculator so that you can continue the problem. So that's my numerator. And then I'm going to go ahead and divide by log, so hit it twice, logarithm of 3. And there we go. And I get Q equals 1.0005340 and some other numbers it doesn't think I can handle. So Q, it says round to the nearest thousand is one, which is 1,000 units. Remember, it's in the thousands. So Q equals one, which is 1,000 units. So let's review. In the first part of the problem, oh, don't look there, that's the graph. We're not ready for that yet. In the first part of the problem, we said, if you want to um, sell 4,000 units, the price should be about $3.33. And then it says here, however, you'll only sell 1,000 units if you set the price as high as 17.32. Now, if you imagine, this is this is a pretty wide um, range for whatever this product is. You know, like if this were a burrito, I don't know that this would make sense. Um, would you spend $17 on a burrito? I don't know. Maybe downtown San Francisco would, but not not everyone. I I wouldn't spend $17 on a burrito. Um, but if you imagine this were a piece of electronics, which, um, you know, maybe normally is $17, but sometimes there's like a super Black Sunday, Black Friday sale to $3 or something like that, you can see that that would, that would be interesting. Now let's look at the graph and see, oh, let me put this back just for a moment because I realized I want to leave this here so you can screenshot it if you'd like. Remember that I also have the notes available for you, both in Canvas and in the Google Drive. And then let's look at the graph. Which I can't really see all of, sorry about that. Um, but again, this is my low tech way of sharing Desmos with you oh, and not blinding you with the ring light. There we go. So here's our equation written. Now in um, Desmos, I'm using X and Y just to make it easier, but you can use other variables in Desmos. And here is my graph. Now remember that our X which was our Q, this is the number of units in thousands. So this was our Q. Um, this is our Q uh, axis, there's the word. And this is our price axis in dollars. Okay, so let's talk about what happened. So first off, what is even happening here? Well, remember the math has no, uh, the math, is, purely math, is going to give you a graph that doesn't necessarily completely match the situation. So can we sell negative units? No, we can't. So this part of the graph, we ignore. We don't use it because it's not useful to us. Negative units... What does that even mean? 
if I sell negative one burritos, does that mean someone just brings me a burrito to give back to me? And I'm, I'm not sure. So let's take a look at what happens right here. We see that we've got an intercept of 0, 030. So what does that mean? That means at $30, remember that's in the dollars, at $30, whatever this thing is, no one's going to buy any. And then there's another interesting point. Now, it looks like the graph goes to zero and just stays there. Does it really go to zero? And we're going to do this door of the Explorer way. Hey guys, does the graph actually go to zero? And the answer is no. This is actually asymptotic. This is an exponential function. And so this graph gets closer and closer to zero. It doesn't actually equal it. So that's Swiper coming in and swiping our asymptote because um, let's be honest, it's really hard to graph something that gets really close to zero. So this is not actually zero, but effectively, so I'll show you, this is 10, so this is eight, six, four, two. Effectively, if we want to sell 10, thousand units, we effectively have to make the product free. It's slightly above zero, so like 10 cents or something. Um, but so if we're just basically giving them away, the most we could get rid of is about 10,000, maybe 20,000 if we make it really, really inexpensive, um, like a penny, maybe less than a penny. Um, so it's not clear over here because I didn't print it out with as much detail, but you can see that the bulk of the graph that we're interested in is right here. And look at this, look at this flexibility and let's look at what's happening. So, well, I should say elasticity really is what I'm looking at. So here's 2000 units. So this is 2000 and this is four. So it's 4,000, right? Cause these are in thousands. And here's six and here's eight. So notice that um, two seams, that it goes right through this point. And in fact, a quick calculation tells me, in fact, yes, we go through this. So what does, tell me about the difference between 0, 30 and 2, 10. And the answer is, if you charge $30, you will sell none of them. If you charge $10, you will sell 2,000 of them. So that's the elasticity of demand. As you lower the price, right? As the price comes down, the quantity sold goes up, the quantity demanded. Which again, in this class, we've got a very simple model where we sell everything that people want us to sell. So anything they want to buy, uh, they, they can buy. There's no inventory issue. There's no supply issue around those. Obviously in the real world, um, when I'm recording this, there's <laughs> massive supply issues. Um, nobody can unload any of the any of the container ships. And so there's been a real problem there. Um, we can't, even if people want to buy stuff, they can't get them off the ships fast enough. So so, but as we lower the price, we see this, if we lower the price by $20, we get up to 2000 people selling it. Now notice that if we lower it, now this is lowering it $20. We can't lower it another $20, but if we lower it only say, um, $5, we're almost, so five, I think it's like right about there. If we lower the price another $5, right, to $5, we're selling, we're almost doubling how many people want to buy it. So you notice that this is not a straight line. This has this scoopy shape, which tells us once we get into this sweet spot area, lowering the price just a little bit will have big responsiveness for demand. So um, that's a very cool, cool aspect to supply and demand is that it's not linear. It doesn't just because this took a $20 drop, this increase. So let's look. So the, to go from zero to 2000 took $20 drop to go from two to 4,000. Let's look right here. That's right about there. 
So what is that price? Well, I'd have to guess. I don't have, the great thing about Desmos is it would tell me exactly, but here I'm just going to have to guesstimate. Um, that price would be, I don't know, around three something. So if we lowered the, the price another $7, we double our sales. Now, is it worth it? I don't know. We'd have to actually calculate what the revenue looks like and see what the revenue curve is so we could maximize our revenue if we felt like doing that. Woohoo. So that's it. I think we've discussed this um, and I think it's really done. I feel like Godzilla really understands a lot more, even though she does have that degree in economics and in math. But um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask Godzilla or ask me. And I would be happy to talk at length about this. You guys are awesome for listening to the whole video. And I hope you have a great night. Speaking of greats, I don't know if you're curious. That is a great in my ceiling. I just, I saw it and I was like, hmm, I wonder what that is. That is the vent in my ceiling. So have a great day and know that you're awesome and um, math on.